Okay, so we're gonna get started. If I can't get there from my iPad, I'll eventually get there. So now we're gonna talk about HashiCorp Zero Trust. And with Zero Trust, um, we're gonna talk about Vault, Console, and Boundary. Um, what I'm gonna try to do is kind of go briefly go over what Zero Trust means to HashiCorp. I'm gonna go over a little bit of Vault, and then I'm gonna pause, and we're gonna go through the first part of our lab. And then we're gonna do have a conversation about Console, and discuss console um, through the presentation here, and then we're gonna go back to the lab and, and work on that through the lab. So the next lab that we do is gonna basically build, uh, we're gonna build a real simple application. It's a little bit different than the HashiCat, applica HashiCat application, not as cool. Um, however, it's gonna have some data in there that we want to, we're gonna load into the database, and then we're going to uh, try to, in so in order for that application to register itself or to read the database, we need to have credentials. Where do we store those credentials? Can we make those credentials automatically be rotated? So we're gonna work through that with, with Vault and Console, and then we're gonna register those applications into Console, into the service mesh, and then we're gonna create um, encrypted least privilege access between the different applications, um, which we call the data viewer and the database. Okay, looks like I'm, I'm all set up here. So. Like we said before with Terraform, um, in, in basically the multi-cloud world, we also have, um, you know, basically in general, we have a problem with securing. I actually really like this icon, right? So we have the cloud, which is kind of funny, but then we have this perforated line around it. That perforated line is exactly what you see, right? So now we've moved out of the four walls of the data center, which used to be trusted, right? We used to have this trusted perimeter. Uh, we'd have a physical data center with one way into the data center and one way out of the data center. Um, we had trusted access, so we'd either have a firewall rule of some sort, we'd have a VPN, um, and everything on the inside of that boundary was secure because we knew that the only way to get into it was through this one moat. They call it the castle and moat approach to um, security. <clears throat> and as the boundaries of the data center have kind of exploded now into AWS and Azure and all the different environments, we have a ton of new APIs that we've opened up. Um, so now we've got this perforated line between all where the boundary of the data center has now uh, exploded, and now we have all these different ingress points. Right? We have a, a, our threat window is open, um, and now in order to get to any of the resources, now we don't have a trusted perimeter, we don't have trusted access, and we have unsecured data. Now we can say like we've you know hit every single endpoint, and we know exactly where everything is, but the truth is with cloud we have so many endpoints that we just have to trust that we don't have a trusted perimeter, that we don't have trusted access, and that we don't have secure data. So what if we were to say something like, trust nothing and authenticate and authorize every interaction and just pretend that they're already on there, you know, bad actors are already in our environment. So with modern infrastructure, if we don't take care of it, if we don't actually deal with the authentication and the authorization and, and the protection of the data, we end up having a modern infrastructure that's scalable and dynamic, but there is no trusted uh, perimeter, there's no trusted access, and we have unsecured data. So th think about the, you know, we'll talk about the anatomy of, of a MITRE attack later. But the idea is, you know, if somebody's on my laptop, if I have, you know, I down, go to some ad blocker, I accidentally hit the ad blocker when I'm trying to get rid of it, and now all of a sudden I have something on my laptop, somebody can get in, they can access local credentials on my, on my laptop, and then they can get into my network, and now they can move laterally through that network and exfiltrate data, right? That's, the, that's kind of the, the concept of the MITRE attack. What if we had to um, make sure that we're authenticating and authorize every time that we do an interaction, whether we're a human and we're connecting to machines or, or services, or, a, or we're a machine actually connecting to those other machines? So the concept with zero trust is it all starts with identity. You remember, if you remember the pillars of zero trust that we showed a little bit earlier in the government, the, like the Roman Colosseum, the first thing that was there was identity, and it does. Zero trust starts with identity. It used to be that in the past that we were just dependent on IP address, and we talked about this in our multi-cloud con uh, conversation, where the IP address didn't really move, so we just trusted that if it was on that IP, if it was on that server with that IP, that we knew that that was the server, that was the web server or the database server that we were trying to connect to. So I'd create a firewall rule between the outside and that new web server, and if you know every six months I had to replace that web server, no big deal, I'll put a ticket in and the network guys will handle it. Um, 
And we have three different types of identities, right? We have application identity. So this is our, in, in, in federal speak, we call it NPE, non-person entity application identity. We have network identities, and we have user identities. Uh, user identity would be something like um, you know, a PE, a person entity. Um, and along with these different types of identities, we add cloud identities. And so now we've got a thousand identity providers that we need to broker, right? So we've got Okta and LDAP and AWS and tokens and JWT tokens and Azure, Kerberos. We've got a million ways to identify what a service is, what a server is, who a human is, but how do we broker that? <clears throat> so we can use Vault. Uh, we can use HashiCorp Vault in order to broker the different identities of all the different types of entities that we have, right? So application identity, network identity, user identity, cloud identity, we can use Vault as the core broker to establish who you are. So if we were going to secure access and data with this trusted identity, we can use Vault at the kind of core, the center of all of this, right? So, um, but what do I want to access? I actually want to access credentials. I want to access um, encryption tokens. I want to access PKI certificates so that I can establish the identity and then give basically the application or the software commit a, uh, a specific PKI certificate that has specific information that we can then look up. Those, those credentials are behind Vault, but then we can use Vault as the authentication provider that brokers all the different types of identities. So applications and identity. We want to ensure applications can access other applications and databases, right? So I'm an application. I'm a web server, and today we're going to kind of do this. We're going to have the data view application. And that data view application is going to work and try to connect to a Postgres database. Well, if I wasn't using dynamic credentials, I'd use static credentials. So maybe I had my user ID and password, and I wanted to store that somewhere outside of my configuration file. I could store it in Vault. So if I need to access that database, first I go to Vault. I um, request access to those credentials. Then those credentials are provisioned to that web server. And then I'm able to connect to the database. My connection string is created. I'm now able to connect to that database. I can also access encryption and decryption tokens. And we'll go over that a little bit. But Vault can actually um, do tra uh, tr transit encryption and tokenization of data. Right. So I can not only encrypt data in flight, but at rest, as well as tokenize data. So if I have a specific type of application data that I want to um, tokenize, meaning Say I have PII, I have a credit card, I have a phone number, I have a name, but I want to change the, those attributes and, and then convert them into something else. Say I have a credit card, I don't want credit card data out there, I can tokenize that data to still do AI, still do all kinds of reports on the types of data, but I'm not actually using the real data. I'm not using somebody's credit card. I'm, I'm using a tokenized version of that credential. So Vault allows us to do all those things, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we have networking identity. OK, so I have my application. I want to register that application. How do I know I am who I say I am? So my application registers itself within console. And then I can create rules between applications based on the identity of that application, based on the PKI certificate, the, the, the issued certificate from the certificate authority. And I can create those rules between the applications, which we're going to do a little bit today. Also with console, we're also encrypting the data. So not only have we created least privilege access between web and database, or application A and database B, or A and web app A and web app B, but I'm also creating, I'm doing least privilege and I'm encrypting the data, right? So to, to the two applications, they look like they're connecting over local host and they're encrypted. So this is a little uh, view of what, what are some of the use cases for console. At the top, we have multi-platform service discovery. A lot of the times, when we have new applications, what we'll end up having is a, um, a legacy environment. And then we're saying, hey, I want to go into Kubernetes. You know, we'll have a 100-year-old uh, weapons platform. And we want to now go to Kubernetes. But 95% of our application stack is sitting on Windows servers or even, even further back as far as like maybe ras not Raspberry Pis, but some sort of strange um, infrastructure. The idea is I want to be able to put console on everything, right? I want to be able to put console on a Windows machine, on a Linux machine, on a Kubernetes service sidecar, um, on, on a Raspberry Pi, and register all my services into a global service registry. I want to be able to have all the different applications discover where those applications are 
And as those dynamic IP addresses are changing around, I want to be able to then create rules between those applications. Then we have a global service mesh and API, and that's so the mesh is actually the encryption and the, and the rules. So basically with a service mesh, we can do away with east to west bound um, load balancers. So for example, um, when I moved into the cloud, one of the things that I found I was doing a lot of was creating a scalable application. And then I was putting a load balancer in front of that scalable application every single time. So I'd have 100 applications that were microservices with an AWS instance uh, load balancer in front of them, application load balancer. And that was great, except it cost us $50 every single time I spun up a new load balancer. And that really stacked up as the amount of applications st um, stacked up. So in this case, we can use console to, um, to not only do the load balancing piece, but also act as a firewall rule. So I, like I said before, my web application needs to talk to database. I'm, I'm able to then create intentions, which are basically, for lack of better terms, firewall rules between applications and say, hey, this application is only allowed to talk to this application. So when it goes out and looks for applications, it's only going to find the one, and it's going to create an encrypted channel between those two. And because we have a service registry, a global service registry we can look things up in, now we're able to take where the IPs are dynamically. So I have my application, it's running in Kubernetes, it's running on spot instances, it's all over the place, the IP addresses are changing every hour. Am I gonna create a northbound um, load balancer ticket every single time that, load, that, I, that service moves around? No. So you wanna be able to do something like network infrastructure automation. Now you can do templating with console, so you can do a network infrastructure automation from a software perspective, right? So I can create templates for all my Apache or my, my Envoy API gateway or my Kong API gateway. I can automatically update those using console templating. But I also have the ability to do things like um, Palo Alto or Juniper or any of the, the network devices that I already have in my physical data center. Since I know where all my service, services are, I can now inform the northbound resources for my load balancers through console and Terraform together as a combination. So we call that uh, console Terraform sync. Con console manages where the IPs are or, or finds where the IPs are and informs Terraform to update the infrastructure in the northbound load balancers if you have hardware load balancers. Which, like I said, we've already got, you know, you might have this greenfield environment, but you have a giant brownfield environment where you still have physical machines and, and services that you need to manage. And then we have our user security. So users and identity. I'm, I'm a, a customer success rep, and I need to access specific data in my database. Or I'm an admin, and I want to be able to SSH to servers. We can use a tool like Boundary. Boundary is our network, our zero trust network access layer. Um, it, it says, hey, if I log in with my Boundary client, I can see here's the list of services that I'm allowed to connect to. And then now I want to connect to that resource, I still need a credential. Uh, in order for me to get that credential, I can use Vault as a, um, a, a joint conversation between Vault and Boundary. Boundary. Vault can automatically inject dynamic credentials into that path. So if I'm a excuse me, customer success representative, and I'm supposed to be managing the data of my marketing team or whatever, or if I'm, let's do this a little bit more in government terms, I'm working at a health organization and I want to manage only a specific set of users based on the state that I'm assigned to, um, I can go in the database and I can do a query, but I can query only Virginia State healthcare records. Um, I can tokenize and I can encrypt that data and I can give credentials only to that specific record or table in the database. Um, and so Boundary will inject that that user ID and password into the connection string. So I never actually have to see the credentials. You can also do something called short-lived credentials, right? So instead of having this, uh, if I query vault, I get the user ID and password, I store it in my config file on my laptop, that's the problem, right? That's the MITRE attack vector. With dynamic credentials, I can have those injected automatically and I can have them expire after 10 minutes. And if, it, if I only go in and check on that database once every month and a half, the time between the time my last credentials expired, which could have been an hour after I used it, and a month and a half later, those credentials didn't exist, right? So there's no way to get access to those credentials and then be able to move laterally through the environment and exfiltrate data because the credentials don't exist. They're not there. So Boundary allows you to do short-lived credentials, um, dynamic credentials, and give you a list of services that only you're allowed to see, right? <clears throat> So, that, so that's basically our replacement for a VPN. So I no longer have to get access to a VPN and then get access to the entire network. 
I'm only connecting through a reverse proxy connection to the list of services and then injecting those credentials. So this is our zero trust conversation. Um, we have kind of two, two outside pillars. That's the authentication and authorization. Vault manages our mas machine authentication and authorization through PKI. So if we're doing PKI for machines, if we're doing PKI for software bill of materials and we want to actually put a timestamp on a code signing certificate, or on the right-hand side, I'm a human and I want to access credentials, um, I, I first have to establish who I am as an identity. And then once I have that identity, I want to now access those credentials or access those resources, whether I'm a machine connecting to another machine or NPE connecting to another NPE or human connecting to a machine, right? So the idea is least privilege, authenticate every single interaction, whether I'm logging in as a human or a machine, or, and also authorize every interaction. So are you allowed to see this resource? You might be able to have the credentials, but you're not allowed, or you might be able to log into Vault, but you might not be able to actually have, allowed to have the credentials to detokenize or de-encrypt the data that's on disk. And this is the entire stack. So Vault, we, do, we are an identity broker. We do data encryption, dynamic and um, static secrets, connect, uh, secrets credential management. Um, we have something, uh, you know, we have RPO and RTO because we can do, uh, a Vault cluster is made of three nodes. To, so basically you can lose up to two nodes and still have full access to all of your credentials. And we can do data uh, replication across to different regions. Um, and then we have operational governance. So again, across all of our enterprise stack, we have uh, policy as code. So instead of, so in Terraform, you would apply policy as you're about to apply that infrastructure into the world. In Vault, you use policy as code to say things like, instead of, does he need, so normally with Vault policies, you say he has create, read, update, and delete access to a policy path, to a path in Vault. To extend that use, we can use policy as code to say, are they coming, are they um, establishing their identity using ping? We only accept ping or Okta as our, as our options for identity authorization. Are you coming from um, IP addresses that aren't on our white list for IP addresses? So we can add a, a bunch of additional, you know, is it raining on a Friday? Is it after five on a Friday? No, we don't want to give anybody credentials after five on a Friday. Um, there's a bunch of reasons you can use policy as code to, you know, whether or not you want to give that access to somebody. Um, then we have console, federated service discovery. Um, so examples of federated service discovery. I might have an AWS region, an Azure, Azure region, an on-prem region, and I want to be able to do service discovery between all these connected regions. I can do that using console so it all looks like one giant data center um, with a different domain, and I can still connect and do least privilege access connections between those different uh, services. Simple service mesh, our network infrastructure automation, which we talked about, uh, access control with API gateway. Again, not only can we do east to westbound load balancers, but we also have a console API gateway. Um, so we can do things like blue-green deploys for our services in Kubernetes, even outside of Kubernetes. Um, and then with Boundary, we have secure remote access, software-defined perimeter. Now we're not connecting into the network, we're connecting to a network resource. And then we can do session management and recording. And just kind of a note on the Boundary piece, Boundary Enterprise is now officially a thing, um, but we can. there's a Boundary open source. Boundary can be used open source, but we have an enterprise and a cloud offering for Boundary, just like we do with our console, Vault, and Terraform, and Nomad. Okay, I'm going to stop there. Actually, no, I'm going to keep going. We're going to start with Vault, and then we're going to do a little bit of the, the lab. Okay, so how does Vault work? So I lo this is one of my favorite diagrams. Um, Vault starts off as a client. There's three types of clients. There's the API, which Vault is all written around a REST API. So every interaction with Vault was started with a REST API, and then we built a client that can basically communicate with that REST API. And then we have a UI. So you can log in through the UI, you can run API commands against Vault, or you can just use the Vault commands, Vault login, Vault read, Vault write. And then we have to authenticate. If we want access to a credential type, we have to authenticate, and we can use any one of these different authentication methods. We call them authentic authentication backends. Um, so Active Directory. So I might have Azure Active Directory, and I might use LDAP for my machines. 
So my machines can authenticate with LDAP, but my users will authenticate using Active Directory. And then maybe um, I'm using EC2 instances, or I'm using EKS. I might want to use the IAM service rule applied to that service, or I might want to use the instance profile applied to the instance instead of using AWS keys. Um, once I've authenticated, then I'm, that authentication is tied to what's called a policy. That policy gives you create, read, update, delete, and list access to a credential path. I'll explain what those paths are, but basically it's the different types of credentials, like slash secret is your static credential, slash database is your dynamic database credential path. So I can read and write down those paths and I get different um, responses back from what I'm trying to read. So that policy is tied to the authentication step. You have a policy, a defedic policy that says I'm allowed to access database credentials. Once I've been granted authentication, I've been granted authorization, I'm now able to pass back that credential back to the client. So first step, vault login, that's the authentication step. Authorization happens on the back end, I then do a vault read. Am I authorized to access that path? Yes or no? Send back the credential back to the user. Um, the other thing that, we, you know, every single interaction within Vault is audited and logged, and there's telemetry data around all of this, right? So if I go to any of our tools and I do a slash metrics, I should be able to get um, any kind of, like, Prometheus telemetry. So I can just do a slash metrics and then load that into Prometheus or any other Prometheus-style uh, metrics analyzer um, that should be able to read that type of, uh, of information. So I can get logs. I can send that off to you know, Datadog, or I can send it off to Splunk, or Elastic, um, an, an Elk stack somewhere. And then we have data protection. Yeah, so data protection, we'll talk about a little bit more. We've talked about it a couple times, tokenization and encryption. So one of the guiding principles is identity brokering, right? So if you're looking for an identity broker, some way to manage all these different identity providers, Vault is the answer. Um, you know, like I said, it became a tier zero, a tier one service in my uh, organization. So if Vault was down, none of our applications worked. It was only down once, and it was my fault. Um, typically, it is when something happened in my last company, um, because I was one person for a long time, which was good because then I was able to get more people. Um, but when Vault goes down, it is a tier one, you know, issue, you know, service like DNS. If DNS is down, you can't get to anything. If Vault's down, you can't get to anything because all your credentials are stored in it. So it's important to make sure that it's, um, you know, you have an RPO, you have an RTO, you have, what we ended up doing is having multiple vaults that we were replicating between. And then each vault cluster is actually a cluster. It's a three node cluster and it passes back the data using the RAF protocol. Guiding principle, we want to extend and integrate um, you talk about different, you know, Terraform has all these different providers. We have over 2,900 providers. We want to do the same thing in the identity world. 100 integrations, 20 identity providers, uh, a secrets engine. So the secrets engines are your dynamic credentials. And then all major cloud platforms, meaning if I want to use Azure or AWS, um, I can use the identity provider in that cloud service provider as my authentication step. But then I want to be able to generate um, Cassandra credentials, or Mongo credentials, or a MySQL server credential, I can do that with the secrets engines. And then we can also provision AWS and Azure cloud identities, right? So if I want to give somebody access to AWS, but I only want to do so for 20 minutes because they're checking on something, <clears throat> I can give them access with uh, dynamic credentials for AWS. It gives them access for a short-lived time, and then that, that expires after whatever your time to live was set to. Again, API driven. So this is an example of a curl um, to get access to the con secret slash config path in uh, Vault. So I'm pointing to the Vault cluster and I'm saying, please give me uh, access to this credential. And then I, at the top there in the header, you can actually see the Vault token. You'd have to pass that in. Um, I typically, so the API is nice because it can actually integrate with, so like Golang, all the different major, uh, all the major languages have libraries to interact with Vault. So we use Ruby a lot, we use Go, we use Java. They all have their own libraries to interact with Vault. So the, it, and it uses the API on the back end. Again, we have auth methods and we have secrets engines. Examples of auth methods are AWS, Azure, 
GitHub, we actually have a GitHub authentication, Okta, Kubernetes. Um, and, and some of these are person or, or human driven authentication and some of them are machine driven uh, authentication like Kubernetes. And then again, that when we say something like a secrets engine, it is like the, the ability to generate dynamic credentials for that secret. And you can see all the examples here. Actually, this is, so in this case, I'm authenticating my service with Kubernetes. I have a service account. So I tie that service account to a policy in Vault. And now I've authenticated. Now I need to access, this is this Postgres. I can't remember what the elephant is. Yeah, I get to access my database, whatever database the elephant is, um, which is a dynamic credential generated for my database. I'm sure everybody online who knows what that is is screaming right now. Is it Postgres? No. OK, anyway, um, your first secret. So uh, this is how I started out. I, I started using Vault. I said, OK, well, I'm just going to use generic Vault, as, as generic as possible, because I just want to get my credentials out of a, a file and put it into a credential store somewhere that's highly encrypted that I have to authenticate to. The first thing I did was I basically said, I want to put my database credentials, my static user ID and password that I generate and I, di and I rotate every 90 days, I'm going to put it down a key value path, just like I would use. It's basically an example of something like a Redis, except for there's an, there's an authentication step to get to it. So it's just a key and a value. The nice thing about the vault, vault key value is there's versions, so you can actually go back. So you change your password and then you forget what the old password is and you kind of hand crammed it. You can actually go back in revision history and, and read the old version of it and update all the files on that old version. Um, so to enable your key value secret, you say uh, vault, vault KV, actually the key value secret mount is actually there automatically. You don't actually have to um, enable it. <clears throat> but in this case, we're saying vault KV puts a key value put. Um, you don't actually need the mount secret. It'll, if you just say secret slash dev db dash api this is one way to do it but the other way is to just put the path secret slash dev api and then the key equals the value right so the key can be foo the value can be bar and you get this mount this value back by getting so you've put it in there and now you want to get it so now i say vault kv get mount equals secret and then you give it the path again you could just say get secret slash dev db api which we'll do today in our in our class our lab <coughs> And then we can also get metadata. So we can get what's the time to live on that credential. We can get things like um, when you created the, the password in the first place. You can get the different versions of that, that credential. So you can just get the metadata. And you can delete a secret just by saying KV delete. So we did put, so in this PDF, if you're looking, if you're joining from home, we have access to all these different um, secrets management resources. You should be able to click through the PDF and be able to access this. These, are, these go directly to the documentation um, so you can access yourself. Again, you'll be able to also do that today in our lab. Dynamic secrets. Again, I've talked about it, um, but basically the idea behind a dynamic secret is, this is actually my favorite story because I learned, not because it was a good story. But I was at HashiConf a couple years ago, which is kind of funny, but I was working for my old company. I was coming back. I was, I, landed, I was in San Francisco, landed in Chicago for a layover, and I picked up my phone, and I had like 50 pager duty events. You know, everybody in my team was screaming, hey, the certificate for our whole domain is down. And why is that? The certificate for the whole domain was down because it expired while I was in the air coming back from HashiConf. And why is that? Because I was only rotating that certificate once a year because that was the life cycle on that. And when you do something once a year versus you do it every single time you interact with it, a, you forget that you had to do it in the first place. B, you forget how to do it, right? So now every single one of my applications had to reload the certificate across my entire cluster. And remembering which of those applications needed to access that certificate is a pain, right? And even if I'm rotating every 90 days, that database password, it's something that I have to remember to do once every 90 days, which is one of those things that I chalk up as, this is toil and I never want to do it again. And I don't want to make the mistake of, coming back to a world where all of my applications are now not, a, not accessible because they expired while I was gone. Makes me never want to have, never be allowed to go to a conference. Um, 
<clears throat> so if we're actually doing dynamic secrets, this just happens every time we log, we, we need to access a credential. So I authenticate my application against whatever identity provider, I go access my credential, and then I'm done. In this case, we're using, um, we're actually creating the AWS secrets backend, so I'm actually going to issue people AWS credentials every time I want to access the AWS console or I want to actually interact with AWS. Um, say my application is an application that only needs access to S3 buckets. In this case, I would first enable my AWS secrets backend. I would then pass in my AWS access key and secret access key. Um, just kind of a note here. In this case, we're passing in credentials. A lot of times we don't want to do that. If we're running this on a AWS service, I would do this through, um, I would actually apply the IAM role to the actual server, so I wouldn't have to pass in these credentials. And then I would tell it what region we're going to actually access these credentials for. And then when I write to this path, the AWS slash role slash my role, actually this is us creating the role for that policy. So we're saying this user, IAM user, is going to use this policy. In this case, we're, this user is only going to allow to um, create EC2 instances. But if this was S3 star, just like I was saying before, um, that application would be able to, you know, add write to an S3 bucket or read the S3 bucket or maybe even delete that S3 bucket. Maybe it just goes and generates short-lived S3 buckets. Well, I want to make sure I have an IAM user tied to only doing S3 things. And then every single time I wanted to interact with that, I would ask Vault first, authenticate. It would give me new dynamic credentials that lasted 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, and it would expire automatically. And then this is me reading that role. Right, so now I have, I do a read, and now I have my secret access key or an access key ID here, or access key ID and then secret access. And you can see the least duration here. So this is 768 hours. I can make that 10 minutes if I want. Like I want to give someone 10 minutes access to, to AWS console so they can go read something on an S3 bucket. I could do that. Again, we have some resources here you can go check out. Those are all clickable in the PDF. Okay, Kubernetes secrets. This is one of my favorites because we're starting to see a lot more adoption of Kubernetes. So we use, in this case, Vault is brokering the identity based on the service account. So the, the Kubernetes service account is, in this case, we'll pretend we're running a Kafka cluster. Um, say Kafka needs access, or say Zookeeper needs access to Kafka. So Zookeeper, I'd be in a Zookeeper namespace. Um, I need to access to Kafka. For some reason, I have, a, I have credentials in Kafka, so I'm going to have to ask Vault for those credentials. Well, I know that the service that I have running in that namespace, based on the service account, is a specific identity, and I can use that identity to establish or to broker the credentials on the back end. So I might, on the back end, need access to, again, those Kafka credentials, which are down some static path somewhere. I can say, hey, Vault, give me those credentials. Um, Vault will give the, the credentials back based on the policy, based on the fact that I've authenticated against my service account. I've authorized against the policy that says, yes, I'm allowed to access this path. And now it'll hand it back. Now, what you see here with the Vault sidecar, we have what's called a Vault agent sidecar that actually sits alongside all of your applications that can manage the lifecycle of that credential. If it's a PKI certificate, when the service spins up, it'll apply a PKI certificate automatically. If it's a credential that needs to be injected into a config file, it'll automatically inject that into the config file uh, parameter. And if it's about to expire, the vault agent, the sidecar, will actually restart that application for you. So you kind of progr programmatically say, when, if this needs to be restarted when I update the credentials, just restart the application, and then it'll spin it up somewhere else in the, in the environment. This can happen in Kubernetes, but that sidecar can be run on a static VM, and we're going to do that today with a Vault agent to kind of show what that looks like. In today's example with the Vault and console, I tried to make it as, as simple of an environment to get an understanding of what the applications can do. So when we go through the Vault, we're not using Kubernetes and Vault sidecars and annotations or any of that stuff. We're just going to do a Vault agent um, binary that's basically pointing at the config file. Here's an example of us injecting. So in our Helm chart, we have server dev enabled set to true. And then we're just saying, in this case, we're going to set our vault address to the vault server. And then we can give it a path to where we want to actually get that credential from. And you can see that in this case, the secret is at path secret hello world. 
Uh, the role, which is a, the vault role, that's it, applied from the service identity is my app. Um, and then we can basically take that data and inject it into um, the, the lifecycle of that, or the config file that needs those credentials. So in this case, we have, um, it looks like we have a, a string here. Our data is a map of the password, which is foobar baz, and the username, which is foobar user. I would get that back from that secret hello world, and I would inject that into the connection string. Some examples, we can, you know, how to use Vault and Kubernetes use cases, how to use it with a Helm chart, and then how to use this agent sidecar injector. Again, one more time on database credential rotation. I have a web application, and actually we're gonna do this here in a second. We, we're gonna have a web application that's gonna be called Data View. It's basically a Go app that runs a web server. And when you query, when you do a curl on that web server, you're gonna get back a JSON blob of a user with all of its privacy information that's, that's pulled from the database. When we first set it up, we're gonna set up with static credentials. And then we're gonna turn on Vault, and we're gonna set up the AWS role and then we're going to set up a secrets engine for, for Postgres, the elephant probably, um, and actually get dynamic credentials injected into the config file, and then it's hands off from that point on for database credentials. And to start that, we do vault secrets enable database. We, you can see here the connection string for that Postgres user. We're using the Postgres database plugin and we're giving it a connection string, a username and password. So that, the, those brackets there just mean this is a variable. When you query that endpoint, it's gonna give you back a, a dynamic username and password. And then we apply a, you know, the allowed roles and then username and password. And then when we vault read that, we get a new username and password. It's dynamically generated. This has a, a least duration of one hour. So how can, what we're gonna see today is that we're gonna, there's a couple ways you could do this. You could say, you know, I have a startup script. This starts my application. I could vault login to authenticate, vault read that path and inject it into some sort of template. But we can also use the vault agent and the vault agent kind of handles that all for you. You give it the, the authentication method. You give it the credentials to get it, use that authentication method. Um, you give it the path those credentials are on. You give it the config file that you wanna update, the template file that you wanna update and then you give it the least duration. And then, and then you also give it what happens when this authentication or when this credential expires. So you can tell it, hey, restart the application when this expires and then inject the new application credentials. And those resources you can find here as well. Last but not least, one of my favorites, I spent a lot of time with the, the Air Force PKI SPO and uh, it's fun. Um, <laughs> and we, we're doing things like talking about um, you know, NPE, PKI, right? So building your own certificate authority for service-to-service -service communication, building code signing uh, certificates for, um, you know, git sign or cosign, different applications that we want to use. Um, and and we, we need to have a CA so we can generate a certificate that's tied to a commit or generate a certificate that's tied to a service that's running. It's not necessarily a user. It's a NPE or non-person entity actually requesting that certificate. Well, every time I request, I can say, you know, here's who I am first. Here's the path to those credentials. If you are who you say you are, I'm going to give you your license or your certificate to, to, that goes alongside your application. We first do a Vault Secrets Enable PKI. This is our secrets engine. And then, we, um, and then when we write to that path, in this case, we have a time to live of 24 hours, we get our certificate bundle. Right, so from the CA, we can actually, at, at the vault level, we can be a root level certificate. We can generate an intermediate certificate from a, uh, a higher authority. So say we were using, in my example, the Air Force PKI, and my sub to that would be an intermediate certificate that might have um, the Air Force PKI or the DOD PKI as the root. I can um, authenticate on their, they give us a PKI certificate, and then all of my applications and all my code signing can be done through um, NPE communication by using Vault as the identity broker for our environment and then and requesting short-lived credentials. So instead of having unencrypted traffic between all of our applications, now we can have a CA that manages the lifecycle of that certificate and can do so automatically. Like I said, certificate manage management is a real pain, especially if it only happens once a year or once every 90 days. Um, it's much better if you just work it into an automated workflow that you don't have to think about anymore. 
Again, resources are here. And the last thing I've touched on a couple times, data encryption and tokenization. Um, in this case, we need to be able to encrypt the data in transit, or we need to be able to encrypt the data at rest. I can do so by generating a sequence engine. I can say, here's my plain text, so my plain text is a credit card number. And in this case, I'm doing base64 as well as encrypting it. And then it shows you what your ciphertext is afterwards, right? Then I can take that ciphertext and decrypt it and say, I want to go to plain text. And then, then I also want to decode that plain text, right? So that's two steps. There's the decryption that Vault does, and then just a base64 decode that anybody can do. Just kind of a note, if you do have a, a base64 encoded file, anyone in the world can decrypt it. It's not encryption. It's actually encoding. Um, well, technically, it could be encryption that everybody has the key to. So anyway, um, that's data encryption. And one more. That's it, actually. So we're going to go back to the Zero Trust Lab, and I'm going to start with the first few um, examples here. <clears throat> OK. Do, do, do. I'm going to actually check the Slack channel anyways, see if there's anybody talking in there. Nope. OK, so zero trust principles, go to the deck. Here we go. That's what I was looking for. OK, we went through the Terraform one. We're going to do now the zero trust application security. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an application. Um, we're going to set up a vault server. So first thing build a vault server, uh, build our application server, uh, create data, and then load that data into the, the database, and then start our web server so that we have to interact with our database. And we're going to just use static credentials. We're going to show you what that workflow looks like. Again, I, got, I put my pretty picture here for it's the same triangle in a different color, but the idea is I have my multiple clients. I authenticate first. I'm authorized through my policy. And then I'm given access to a set of secrets based on my policy, and those are issued back to the client, whether the client is a web front end, the Vault CLI, or the Vault UI, or the API. This takes a little bit because I'm actually spinning up a few uh, containers. And if we have 350 people also spinning up containers, that's going to be fun. Um, we'll see how, how Instruct can handle how many people can do this. We're waking the hamsters. That's, that's what it's doing at this point. <clears throat> Do you have any questions while we're waiting on this about Vault and, and kind of use cases? We hit kind of some of the big ones, but. Of the, data, of the user, yeah. There's actually a, a rotation utility that manages that credential. That's a good question. So like, say I do have a 90-day. I could set it to every 30 days or every 10 days. I can rotate that, that admin user automatically as well. Yeah, it, it's one of those like chicken and egg things. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, wait, there's this guy, this service that's just managing these brokers and can do whatever he wants. Yes, that can be automatically rotated as well. The same. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and the same thing goes for PKI CA, right? Like, I still have a CA that I have to manage. That can be automatically rotated. And then every leave certificate, we can actually have two. So say you have um, a 90-day rotation on intermediate certificates, at least. You know, if you're not doing one-day rotation or 10-day rotation, you're doing 90-day rotation. I would spin up a secondary intermediate. And this can all happen automatically. And then all new LEAF certificates can be issued from the second one. And then all the old ones would expire off and then move over to the new intermediate certificate. So there's a rotation aspect as well for PKI. OK, so Vault. So we want to kind of play around with Vault in general. Um, we have the 
this is, remember I talked about before the three different types of clients. We have the Vault CLI, the Vault UI, and the Vault um, API. In this case, we're using Vault 1.13, which I'm pretty sure is the latest or, or pretty close to the latest because I just built this. Um, we're going to start the Vault service. Actually, let's go over here and look at the Vault UI. So this is what the Vault UI looks like. Um, we have to log in with the token. I'm pretty sure I set the token to be root. So, yep, I did. It's a very simple token. So, okay, just kind of a little background on a vault cluster. You spin up a vault cluster, you typically spin up three of them, and you'll say bootstrap expect that there's going to be three nodes. Well, if you're running this in AWS or you're running this in Azure, there's a way that you can set tags on the three different servers that are in that cluster to say, like, vault uh, type equals vault server. And then those vault servers would know that to look, because we've set the configuration file to go look for those tags, and to automatically know that this is a vault server, right? And it would join the vault cluster. And so I could have an environment, which I did. I set up an environment where my vault and my console clusters were all on spot. So if you haven't used spot instances, they're uh, way cheaper. So they're 70 to 80% cheaper to use, um, but they're not stable at all, right? So I was losing vault servers and console servers all the time, but I wanted to inject chaos as a kind of mode of operation. Like, I would always have chaos going on in my vault cluster. But it didn't matter. I'd lose a vault server. A new one would come up. It'd run all the configuration management. It would come up. It would go, hey, AWS, am I really a vault server? Yes, you are. And then it would join the vault cluster automatically. When that, if that, so the identity brokering piece of that would, would say, yes, vault, you are who you say you are, based on the fact that you have this uh, vault role applied to it. And then it would get the key that's in the key management system and then automatically unencrypt the uh, vault. So when, the, when a vault server sp spins up and it uses the configuration file, it has access to the data that's local, but it's all encrypted. So I have to pass these unseal keys to open up the vault. Right? Like un it's the uh, de decryption mechanism for unsealing the vault. Um, that we can use what's called an uh, automatic configuration unseal. Uh, auto Unseal, automatic unsealing, whatever configuration. But for, if you're using like an HSM or you're using AWS or Azure, you can store those keys and provide access to those keys and automatically unseal your vault cluster. So then you can add that, that little level of chaos where you just kill a server, a new one comes up, and now you have a vault cluster that's fully running. Um, okay, so vault CLI. Uh, we're gonna, we, it looks like we already started the vault service. So if I do a system CTL status vault, we're running. Um, and I'm just going to do a, a quick vault. So these are two variables that are important um, with vault, vault adder and vault token. Vault token is less important if you are in the future are using AW or if you're using some sort of authentication method. If you don't set up an authentication method, your, your core source of authentication is through a vault token. Um, there's a default token that's created when you first start a vault cluster. And in this case, um, I just set it to root because this is a dev environment. I started this in development mode. To start a, a vault um, in development mode, you just say vault server dash dev, right? That's very simple. It spins it up and unseals it for you. It does all the fancy stuff just so you can play around with the credentials, but you never use it in production. We're doing this for the lab, so it's no big deal. Um, these two, there's another vault variable that's important. Um, in this case, the vault address is vault server 8200, and the vault token is root. Um, the, uh, the third one would be vault namespace. So if you're using an enterprise vault, you can do things like multi-tenant vault, right? So I might offer a service to all my customers, and each customer would get their own tenant within that vault service, right? So I would say vault namespace equals open govcon. Um, that's the third thing you'd want to add. Okay, so I want to do a vault secrets list. Now, these are the list of secrets engines. We keep talking about the different authentication methods versus secrets engines. The, this is the list of secrets engines. There's a bunch of them that get created automatically. The sys one, this one is basically uh, a default standard. Like all of the stuff that happens behind the scenes happens on this path. We don't, you don't touch it. It's really just for control, policy, and debugging. Um, the secret KV path, this is literally static credential management. I can store my credentials. I can have them expire at a certain time, and they can be static credentials. This is where I kind of started, right, the secrets engine. Um, and then I started moving into using dynamic credentials. And then cubbyhole is like a, 
almost like LastPass for Vault. So you could store something on a cubby hole, it's gonna expire, somebody can go grab it. You can give it access to a specific user in Vault. But we're gonna just explore putting something on like a, a key and a value on a path in, in, on the secret info path, right? So I'm gonna first set my variables. We'll say user equals the fed password or age equals way too old. 45, and then um, vault kv. So then we're going to actually write that to a path, right? So I'm going to say vault kv put secret. This is the path, secret info. And then I'm going to say name equals, since I don't want to type all that, I'm going to copy and paste, and then age, and then close the bracket, and then close the quote. So now... I've written to the secret data, the secret path on the secret info. The data is in there, which is interesting. If I want to go get that path, I can say vault read, um, vault kv get that info. All right, so this is the metadata I was talking about before. So you can actually query just the metadata, or I can query the data that's actually in that path. So I can say, give me this information, right? So secret data info. Um, and you can see age is set to 45, name is set to the Fed. Now, there's also, if you're into, if there's a reason you want to get this in a different format, you can say dash format equals JSON, right? So maybe I want to get it in JSON. Well, I have to put it in a different path. I'm going to get it here. I know it's somewhere. KV get. Yep, format equals JSON secret info. There we go. And then I could do something like JQ data, data age, right? So now I can get 45, right? So I can just get the specific thing that I'm looking for. There's a couple of different format types. If you're, if you're writing bash scripts using J, JQ, it's very easy to get through JSON, parsing JSON. Um, so that's another way you can do it. But I can also go into the UI now that I've logged in, and I can go back to the secret, go into the info directory, and I can actually, I have my age and my name. I can say show that or show that, or I could just copy it into my buffer, right? So that's just a normal static credential store that's, you know, can be FIPS 140, uh, FIPS 142, level two, and we're coming out with another binary, uh, level three. We can store credentials in the HSM, that's FIPS 140 as well using Vault as kind of the intermediary. Um, so that's, that's Vault, uh, the, the Vault CLI. So this is just us starting the Vault cluster. All right, so we're gonna check to make sure that's kosher. Um, again, we saw the Vault token. The Vault token is set to root. Okay, so in this example, OpenGovCo, which is this amazing company, has a Postgres database with a list of their users. Uh, the following variables will be helpful when trying to interact with the database. So we're going to have host name, PG ports, the Postgres port, Postgres user, Postgres password, database variable. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this temp users.json file, which is 50 records of a bunch of random users with a bunch of random personal identifiable information. And then we're going to use the data load command to load it into the database. So first thing we're going to do is we're just going to interact with the database just to show that we can, right? So I'm in the database. It's an empty database. Do a list. You can see the databases. And then I'm going to connect to, I actually have a users. Uh, before this started up, it actually built a users table. So I'm going to connect to that users table. And then I'm going to list. Sorry, the database. Um, right, so there it is. There's the users database. And then I'm going to do... All right, so now that we know we have a user's database, um, we can connect to it locally using the Postgres uh, user. <clears throat> now I'm gonna start loading data into it. So first I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cat my file. So I've got this big file, it's got 50 different users and they're all random, right? But uh, I've been told that I really need to get these into our CRM database as soon as possible and I need to deal with the dynamic credentials and I, I, wanna, I want some sort of application that interacts with this data. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load this data into the database. Well, first I'm going to check to make sure it's empty. So I'm going to run this psql command. So I'm going to use the existing user, the existing password, the database, and the port, 
I'm going to do a select star from users. This should give me empty, right? There's nothing in here. Users do not exist. And I'm going to use my data load command, which will use that, those connection string. I'm going to pass in the, the user ID and password is literally Postgres, Postgres. So it's not very difficult. And I'm going to load this users.json file in there. So now data loaded successfully. I should now be able to query that database. So I'm saying connect using psql to the users database and select name, email, and social security and credit card from users. So I'm just going to copy that little command. And I should get a list of um, users that are in that database. So now it's nicely formatted. It's in a database. It's uh, formatted nicely. I can now do things like query, which I just did. I just got four columns out of the, I think, I think there's like 10, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's like 12 different columns I can get out of here. So now we've loaded data into the database. We have a full database. We have, but we're using the credentials um, user ID, or the user ID is Postgres and the password is Postgres, which nobody likes. But for right now, we're just going to start up our data view. Um, I think it's called data view, not data viewer. I'll have to go back and fix that. Um, but we're going to use the data view web server that we're going to start. And then we're going to be able to do a curl on that web server uh, and then get back out just a random user, an element from that user database. So I'm going to do a curl. And every single time I run that curl, it's going to give me a new example. So I'm going to start my, so I'm going to do system status data view. OK, it's dead. So we're going to start it. Run that again. And now it's running. OK, and then now that it's running, the config file, I'll show you in a minute. Now I can just do a curl on app server, which is this, the name of this server, on port 8888. And I get a random user. I can keep running that until the cows come home. And I get different users every time I query. So that's my web server. It's real, real fancy. Um, and then, so just real quick, my, my data view, the config file for this web server is, is found here. Whoop, cat, cat. Um, it's very simple. Username is Postgres, password is Postgres, host, port, database name, and web port. Those are the different elements of my configuration file for the data view service. Now, this, I have to figure out how to rotate this password automatically. Right? I don't want to let it sit as Postgres and Postgres. So we're just going to check, get through to the next one. OK, so this is the best part. Well, one of the best parts, I think. Um, now we're going to enable Vault Dynamic Database Credentials for Postgres. So it's a little bit longer of a process. We kind of saw what that looked like over here. So the last challenge, we started with the Data View web server. Now that we have it, the web server is located um, at Data View. So user local bin Data View. And the config file is at this dataview.yaml file. Um, most organizations have to change every 90 days. So instead, we're going to enable the Vault Dynamic Database Credential, and we're going to use a different config file. So we're going to first, since we already authenticated against Vault, first we're going to enable the secrets engine for database. So this secrets engine, this database secrets engine, has the ability, based on the uh, plugin, to interact with almost any database out there. I mean, everything from Snowflake to uh, Mongo to Redis to MySQL to Cassandra. Like, if you have a database, for the most part, It'll work. You just have to use that version of the credential uh, secrets engine. In this case, we're going to configure with the PostgreSQL database. This is probably the elephant. Um, and we're going we're to write to this database using this string. So you see the connection URL. It's using the username. It's, it's going to, every time you query, it's going to use this connection string of Postgres, new username, new password, at app server 5432. 5432 is the port. Um, and then it's going to connect to the user's database. So you're, you're actually setting up a connection string for the specific data view role in, in Vault. So I set that up. So now I've created the role. Um, we can tie that role to specific policy within a, a creation statement. So if I have this data view role, the database name is user. I can actually tie the creation statement. So whenever you create a user in a database, you usually tell that user what roles you want to give it in the database. This is nice. So again, I go back to my customer success example. 
I had a, I had customer success reps, and they were only allowed to connect to, you know, we'll call it American Eagle, as their um, their retail brand they were managing. We didn't want to give them access to other um, retail brands that they weren't allowed to access. So how did we do that? We gave them specific dynamic credentials to a set uh, to a database or to a table in a database. You can create uh, grant roles to a record in a da database if you want to. Um, so in this case, we're going to say grant select on all tables in the schema public to uh, name, but we're basically giving access to the user's database. And then here's the database name. So we're saying in the, we're going to create a role in the database that's tied to the user that we're going to generate. So we're going to copy that into here. OK, so now let's test that role. So we can actually do a vault read. So before we did a vault read on the KV or the secret slash info um, path, in this case, we're going to do a vault read on the database roles data view path. So let's do a vault read database roles data view. And now you can see, oh, this is the actual role itself. I'm sorry. This is the role. And so you can actually look at the role. You can see what your default TTL is. If you wanted to modify that, you can go back to the previous statement and change the default role. This, for example, if you're doing this for something like a PKI certificate and you want to manage the time to live for LEAP certificates, you could do that through this role. In this case, we're saying there's a default role of one hour. So if you need access to the database, you have an hour to do it. If you have some users that might need three hours because they need to exfiltrate a lot of data, like uh, some bad actor, you want to give them access to something, you want to do it for three hours versus one hour. Um, that, that was a joke, by the way. And we're going to do, now we want to actually run the command. Instead of actually reading the role, we're going to actually read the creds on that path. OK, so now you can see we have a username. The username is v-token data view, blah, 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 and then the password. Right, so this is, and every time I query this, it generates a new user ID and password in the database with an expiration token on it. You can go in and do a vault token revoke on a specific uh, token ID. So I can look at that username and I can take that token ID and I can expire or revoke that that I've, I've handed off to a user. Um, and, and if you have um, an application and you only want to give it short-lived credentials and they're logging in all the time, you might want to give it uh, like one hour, right? And then I'll just rotate those credentials. But a lot of times, there's really no need to rotate the credentials that often. You rotate them once, you know, every few days, 10 days, 30 days, whatever you have the, you need to do. Um, so in this case, we're just going to set the you know, set those username. Well, first, we're going to actually get the value. So I'm, in, in this variable, the creds variable, I'm saying vault read and that format JSON. So I'm getting it in JSON format. I'm going to output it to this data view. Uh, or I'm going to get the creds from this path. So if I set that, I can echo dollar sign creds. And now I can see the JSON version version of that path. Right. So now there's my user ID and password, and it changes every time I query it. OK. But now I just, instead, I'm going to take that PG user and PG password and just grab these two bits of information out of that data. So this is something I would do if I was actually running this in a bash script. I would set the credential, I would grab the key, and then I would want to set the user ID and password in that, right? So I'd grab the, the entirety of that JSON and then use the jq to command to actually set pg user and pg password. So this is an example of how you could do that if you're running this from the command line. So echo dollar sign pg user, echo dollar sign pg password. Right, so there you go. Oh, which it tell, gives you right here, I could copy that. OK, so then now I can use those credentials, PG user and PG password, and um, query. Did I put password in there? Hopefully this works. Um, oh, pa OK. Just see, the, the reason why I don't have to pass in password here is because it, the actual PG password variable is an auto. It, if Postgres sees that there's a PG password, it'll actually automatically ing ingest it. So I only had to. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I would have sat here for a while. <laughs> there you go. So now I uh, run my psql command. I can get just the last name or just the, 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 entirety, the entire name of the first five entries in the database. So this is just using psql. 
and I've used the PG user and PG password, which I, are automatic, and I pulled from Vault as a dynamic credential. And in an hour, those will expire. Um, one thing I didn't write into this was the ability to revoke tokens, but we can show that. Um, vault revoke. Um, I'm going to have to go back to that one. I'll do it once I have it built out. I can't remember the exact commands, but there's a way to like list all of your users and then revoke one. Um, and then check the, the metadata on those. Okay. Setting up. Okay, so we have the secrets engine built, and we're interacting with Vault based on the root token. But now we want to add in an auth engine that allows us to, you know, get access to that credential. So we're going to use the AWS auth backend. With instruct, it gives us the ability to use AWS keys. So we're going to kind of use that AWS, um, AWS access key and secret access key ID as the authentication method to access those credentials instead of using the root token, which we want to do away with. Right? We want to use the policy that only gives us enough information to get access to the credentials that we need and not full-blown root access to the world. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is enable the AWS off backend in Vault. This will allow us to authenticate and authorize using AWS IAM. So before we enable the secrets engine, now we're, we're enabling the auth backend. So we're going to first say enable AWS. Um, and you can see the description here. I'm saying the description is this. Success I um, auth at the AWS path. Next, we need to configure the AWS backend. So I can actually configure that. And um, I can use, say secret key equals this, access key equals this. Now, because of the environment I'm in, and I enabled AWS on the, in this lab, I got free tokens, uh, free access key and key, access key and secret access key. So if I do ENV and I grep for AWS, they're already in here. You can see I get these for free. Now, normally you wouldn't get these for free. You'd have to, based on the identity of the, of the server or based on the service, maybe I was running an ECS, I could use a service identity tied to an actual policy. Um, and, and my account ID, all those things could be generated dynamically. I wouldn't have to actually set them as environment variables. But in this case, since that's what I have, I want to show kind of the use case here. Uh, okay, so we have these, these keys here. So I, um, I'm going to configure the AWS role. So I should first do a vault auth list. So before, I should have done it before, but before I had the token role, so that was you know the root token that I passed in, now I have the AWS role. So I technically should be able to, um, in the vault UI, should be able to see AWS in here. Uh, I don't see it. Oh, yes, we have to refresh. No, I can't remember why that's not working. We'll figure that out later. <laughs> but AWS tokens listed there. We have vault off list showed us that AWS is available. Um, let's see. Oh, if we go to the off methods, so if we just go in, use the root token. Uh, root. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay, cool. Access auth methods. So now we have the AWS auth method here. And you can see the configuration for that auth method. So in the shell window, create a policy for the data view role. So now we've we talked about the three steps, right? Client talks to an authentication method, gives you access to a secrets engine, it gives you a credential, and it passes back to the client. That policy step, that authorization step, we need to be able to up create a policy file and tie it to the AWS role. So in this case, we're creating a data view policy. So that data view policy should give you access. So um, the nice thing with, with vault policies is you say, okay, path, and here's the path. So you know, I'm going to give it dynamic credentials. I'm going to give it access to the off path to renew self. Okay, so I can do a vault renew on my own token in this case. Um, I could do a, a, a lookup on the leases. So if I don't have that, I, I can't even check to see when my, my credentials expire. Auth token accessors. I want to be able to do a vault read on a token. 
And if I can do a vault read on a token or a, a vault lookup on a token, I, could, I can actually see what policies and what paths are applied to that token. So the nice part about that is if you're, so I used to work with a bunch of um, developers and they were always asking for additional credentials and they would, for whatever reason, fail in trying to access a, a vault path. And I'd say, well, can you do a vault policy read or a vault token lookup and tell me what policies are applied to that token? Well, the policy, um, when you do the vault policy read, it would list out all these paths right here. So I'd say, well, you're trying to get to the secret database directory and really the database passwords and database creds data view, right? So that was one of those things that, uh, that's why I enabled this auth token accessors lookup, the ability to read that so they could, they could do a list and see what paths they have access to. It just helped with troubleshooting. And in this case, we're giving access to one real path, which is the database creds data view path. Um, so now this user will be able to access this. Okay, so all I did here, I didn't do anything in Vault. All I did was create this HCL file. All right, so I just created the policy, and now I want to apply that policy. Remember, this is the Vault. So now I'm creating a Vault policy called Data View, and I'm using this specific path, this HCL file. Now, another thing as far as troubleshooting is concerned or as far as production environments are concerned, instead of doing it this way, I started to manage all of my vault policies and all my credentials via Terraform. So Terraform, I can use the vault provider and I can apply policies based on Terraform. So if there are changes to somebody's vault policy, it doesn't happen outside of my version control system. So say I have a, a, data, a developer and they want access to a new path, there's an approval step that goes through that. Right, somebody has to approve that, a secondary person. So I would typically do all of the vault workflows through Terraform. In this case, I'm just showing you how to use it um, using the vault binary. Um, and then we're, we're gonna write this new policy. You can see the auth type is IAM. Um, the policy is data view. We have a, a max lease of one hour and we're binding this to a specific um, IAM principle using those credentials, so I, I pass in my account ID. So now, I'm using the auth method for AWS instead of my root token, basically. So now I'm gonna say vault login, method is AWS in this case. Before, if I did a vault login, it would just, you can say method equals user, or token, and then you'd pass in the root token. And then the role is gonna be data view, which we just created, and then the access key and secret access key ID. So I'm logging into Vault. This is my authentication step. Boom. So now I'm, I'm logged in. I have, I'm actually given a token back, which is basically the interaction between you and the Vault cluster. Uh, you can see that there's a, a least token dur duration there. And now I want to be able to read this policy again. And remember what I said before, I want to be able to, so now that I am logged in, not with the root token, but my AWS, AWS token, I can now still do that vault policy read that I was talking about if I'm working with the developers and, and they're having access to a path issue. I can then say, okay, well, we'll do a vault policy read and tell me what you have. Um, and then now I'm gonna actually read those credentials. So now, because I was given access to this path, read and list, I can do a vault read on that specific path and get a new user ID and password. So that's, setting up the AWS authentication method and the secrets engine. Now, if I were doing this programmatically and if I were doing this in a world where I want to have very similar outcomes every single time I do it, you know, I'd probably be using Kubernetes. I'd probably be using Terraform as my form of um, deployment of all my, my policies and deployment of all my, or the writing of those tokens. Like everything would be done through Terraform programmatically. I'd have to get approvals. Um, you know, I, what I want to show is kind of like the bare bones examples of how to do this and like how you interact. So we can kind of think about that triangle of client authentication, secret back to the, 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 authentic, the, the user, the existing user, whether that user is a machine or a service or a user. So then we do check and it should say, hopefully that we're well done. Okay, so I think the next one starts off with console. Oh, okay, we have one more step, the vault agent, right? So now, now I, have, you know, I don't have those static credentials anymore. 
Now, how do I manage the life cycle of those, those dynamic credentials, right? We have a one hour life cycle on that credential. I want to automatically rotate that credential. If I were running this in Kubernetes or some other uh, orchestration tool, I would run a sidecar called a vault agent that would automatically rotate those credentials for me and inject those into the path. We're going to do this now using just like a vault agent running from the command line. We're going to do a service vault agent start. And we're going to take a look at the, the configuration file used to manage those credentials. Again, this, is, this takes place of the person who's actually going out once a year and rotating those credentials for you and, and reaching out to your certificate management, your CA. So we're going to install a vault agent. We're going to configure that vault agent, and we're going to start it up, and we're going to see that the, you know, we've injected those into the application. Okay, so if you remember, there's a data view.yaml file. It's in cat etsy data view.yaml. This was our web server, and this is how it interacted with um, our database. The username and password was Postgres, right? We want to change that. So we're going to switch that over to the data view dash dynamic credential file. Um, that doesn't exist yet. We have to start the vault agent to generate that dy dynamic file. In this app code, tab, we have examples of the following. So we have a template. This is actually what Vault is going to read and then generate a file for us. So you can see at the top here, we have with secret, and then we have that path that we created this at the secrets engine. So with this secret, we're going to inject the username and the password into this template. And out of this, we're going to get a data view dash dynamic dot YAML file. Oh, how do we know that? Well, first we have... Um, this is the vault agent configuration file. Um, so auto auth, we're saying use AWS, the authentication method. Um, we're going to use the role data view, which we set up earlier. And then we're going to, um, th there's, there's a token involved here, and that's what this is. It's just saying it, when you manage the token, the life cycle of that token, it's going to be here in this path. The vault server that we're actually going to interact with, where these credentials are stored. The source template is this data view dynamic, which we just took a look at, which has that like Go style templating. And then the data view dynamic .yaml file, which is the output, right? And then once I read that, what do I want to do? I'm going to restart on change in this case, right? So this is a service script, so it's using the service plugin. It would just do a system CTL restart on the data view service. So this is the configuration for Vault Agent, and then this is the template that that vault agent is going to create a file from. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? That's so, kind of a lot of pieces and parts. Yep. The TTL. Yeah, so vault agent, exactly. So on startup, so we're going to start the vault agent first, and then we're going to restart our, our data view web server with the new configuration file. Then after that, that data view service will restart. Yeah, so we're saying when this, check the time to live on that token, and when that token expires or before, right before it expires, restart the data view service um, and then create a new data view dynamic.yaml, which we'll be looking for because our service script points to it. Right, so. Exactly. Yeah, so what he asked, this is very important. So from a developer app dev perspective, I don't actually modify my actual application. All I'm doing is passing in new user ID and password. So there's no um, use of, uh, so I don't have to modify my application at all. I could if I wanted to, right? So I can actually have the application use the Vault library for Go or for Ruby or for Python to interact with Vault and then start restart itself or just update the configuration file, but I don't have to. I can use this Vault agent as a sidecar to that service that manages it for it. So if in a lot of environments, we just don't have the ability to write Vault into the library and, and make application changes. We want to do so from the outside in, right? That's a, that's a great question. So we just took a look at that. Uh, we're going to do a Vault read on that data view. 
you can see we get random user ID and password. We're going to do, quickly look at both the data view service. So this is how the data view service is started. It's a Go binary. You pass in that config file, which instead of passing in etsy slash data view dot yaml, now we're going to use the data view dynamic file, which we're going to generate. And then the vault service is literally just vault agent. We pass that configuration file we just took a look at. And then um, that's it. We just have some log levels on there. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to start the vault agent, right? So this vault agent should go out. Let's just make sure it's still started. System, CTL status, vault agent. OK, we have it running. So technically, we should have our YAML file that was created. So we're back over here. And now that template generated, this template generated this YAML file. Now we have a new username and password, and we can restart. So now we're going to, we did the status. So we're going to actually, you can see the difference here, cat etsy data view dot YAML versus the other one. Right, so now, um, yeah, this one. <laughs> that's the template, and that's the file that was generated. Right, so instead of using Postgres, Postgres now, we're actually using these dynamic credentials. And again, to go back to um, Camden's uh, previous question, which was, well, how do we manage the manager in this case? So there's a way to rotate vault, the, the vault root admin that manages the database credentials that are in the database, and that, hap that can happen automatically as well. I didn't put that in, in this, but there is a way to do that. Um, so we do we start the database? The data, yeah, we did not start the data view script, so we're going to start data view, which worked off of this service script, which points at the new data view dynamic YAML. And now we should be able to query the data view web server just like we did before and get a different user every time we query it. And that's it. So now we are authenticating with AWS. We're generating a dynamic credential, and um, we're interacting. And now the Vault agent is managing the life cycle of that. So now when I go to HashiConf next year, I don't have to worry about my certificates expiring or my database credentials expiring on me for whatever reason. I think the next one's console, and I want to pause there. Yes, OK, the next one's console. So I'm going to quickly go over console and the features of console, and then we'll do the last couple. I think we have, we have 30 minutes, so that's perfect amount of time to go through what console does for us in this case, play with console a little bit, and then it'll be, we'll be done. So vault. OK, so for now, come on, you can do it. Yes, OK, perfect. So we have uh, HashiCorp console. Console is a, so starts off as a tool for service discovery. I actually started using, believe it or not, console first. Um, I, I started using it in 2014, which was very early on in the, in the world of, of HashiCorp tools. Vagrant was the first tool, and I think console came next. Vault was out at that point, but I started using it because I, I was in the data center, and I wanted to have something that could manage services from the data center and in my AWS cloud. So I literally was using it for the use case that we talk about here, the multi-cloud world, where I want one common tool for two different places, one workflow for those two different places. So I started off way over on the left here with service discovery and health monitoring. I actually wrote a script that monitored the health of all my services using service discovery and using console. And then once something went unhealthy, it would page out to pager duty. Um, that wasn't the best monitoring tool. At the, at the end of the day, I ended up switching over to Prometheus. But it worked for me as a one-person shop at the time. Um, so it does monitoring. So the other thing is when you query something in console, you actually can query it via an HTTP API. You can query it via DNS, right? So I can just replace my normal DNS with console DNS. And now I can query all my services, and I'm only getting a response back from my healthy services. So if I want to know where all my IP addresses are, I'm only getting the healthy IP addresses back from that DNS query. 
We have a secure service mesh, which means basically if I want my, um, my services to communicate with each other, I want least privilege. I want to authenticate saying you are the identity of the application you say you are. And then I want to create least privilege and encryption between those applications. Automation, again, network infrastructure automation, console Terraform sync. If I, I know my service discovery, I know where all my applications are, I know how healthy they are, now I can update my northbound application resources, whether that's a firewall that's virtual, like an HA proxy or Apache or a Kong, or my physical infrastructure, like my F5 or my Palo Alto. And in the last two years, we added an API gateway. It used to be that we were only kind of at that application layer, but we, the, the layer four layer at the service mesh, but we, we didn't actually have an API gateway where we could do kind of higher level abstractions and blue-green deploys and um, you know, path routing and all that kind of stuff. So now with console, we can, we can inject ourselves in the, the endpoint, the northbound resource, it's the API gateway, and all of our east to west application traffic. Oh, it's going to make me do. OK, cool. Um, central source of truth to tra track services. Instead of saying, hey, somebody else needs to manage my services for us, when the, when the application is deployed, at deployment time, it registers itself. And at that point, we can say, here's my health check. Um, you know, my, my health check is at, at slash health on this port, right? So <clears throat> I can say my web server health check is on slash health on port 888. And if it's not responding there, then it's down. You know, I can also do that with a TCP port. Um, there's a bunch of ways you can do the health check. And then once the health check is positive, it registers in the, in the service registry as a official service that you can query. Um, in, in this case, you can see uh, console applies service identity to any service registered to it. So whether you're running in AWS, you're in Kubernetes, whatever, you, wherever you're running your services, on-prem, in the cloud, on Kubernetes orchestration, we have a, a common way to do identity provisioning for our MPE. And now we can uh, establish, establish the identity, issue certificates. So this is interesting about console. Console can also act as a CA without Vault. But if you already have Vault and you have a root of trust, you've done your ceremony for PKI, and you, the Vault is the approved way you do things, console can say, I want to use Vault as my CA and we'll act as the intermediate. So, um, or we can just cut console out and, and only interact with Vault. So we'd establish the identity based on console and then issue the certificate with Vault. It's a very, very cool way to do it. Um, a while ago, Vault used its storage backend in console, but now Vault can actually go not use console. So we've kind of, we're, we're trying to take a model of separating concerns from all of our applications. So if you just wanted to buy console, you could use console. If you just wanted to buy Vault, you can use Vault and not have to have all these um, intertwined um, application um, use cases. However, you can use, in every one of our applications, we have a lot of integrations. So Nomad uses console, doesn't have to. Nomad uses Vault, doesn't have to. Same with Kubernetes, we can use console or Vault, but we don't have to. Um, we can use Terraform, Terraform and console can integrate. There's a bunch of integrations between all of our applications, but they don't have to. And this is, this is great for us because we have conversations where people say, like, Hey, if, if the answer is console, I don't want to have a conversation. We only use Istio here. That, that's just how we do it. We're only Kubernetes shop. And that's fine because we can talk about Terraform. We can talk about Vault because we've separated those concerns. Um, and that's what we're talking about here. <clears throat> okay, and security, uh, secure service mesh. Secure connectivity. So we're, we're doing mutual TLS. We have encrypted traffic on transit. So if I'm web server A and I'm database B, um, I want to be able to communicate. So I can create intentions between those two different services that say, hey, least privilege access between these two applications. And it looks like, for all intents and purposes, that application A and, web and database B are only talking over local host. So to them, there's a data plane that looks like there is no other network outside of that network. Right? If I'm connecting over those ports, it just looks like a local host connection. Um, this is super helpful, mitigating developer burden to enforce security. So now, instead of me having to go to the network team uh, to, to issue a, a CA, instead of having to go to the network team to find out where these services are, update our, our northbound resources, I don't have to do that anymore. I just register my service into the, to the service mesh, and now I can establish my identity, get encryption, and least privilege access between my applications. And to be honest, the people who understand the application and what 
should connect to each other the most are the ones who are writing the application. Like I know in my data view app that the only thing I'm connecting to is that database. That's the only thing I need to create an intention for. But sometimes after you've created it, it's three or four weeks later, the network guy says, hey, what firewall rules do you need open? And you kind of forget, and then you have to set things. It, it, it just becomes a pain. So if the developer's doing it on deployment time as a part of the deployment mechanism, then things are remembered a lot easier. Uh, consistent security, we can do things like policy as code. Um, we're sep so we can also do uh, separating infrastructure silos across. So I can actually uh, create a console for different namespaces as well. Just like I did with Vault, I want to offer a, a Vault namespace for a tenant. I would have multiple customers and their own console services. So one example is if I had multiple enclaves and I wanted to be able to have those on the same network but separate as far as logically, they are not able to communicate. They're using console as the, uh, the multi-tenant environment that's serving a, their own version of that console. And if I wanted to, I could create mesh gateways in between the different networks. So it's basically like I'm creating multiple different networks on the same service mesh. Governance, uh, same thing, policy as code. Uh, I want to make sure that I have additional policies on who has access to what. And that's where we're adding policy as code into the lifecycle of uh, the, the console service. Delivering zero trust principles to access and communication. If we go back to that, um, I actually really like this. So we've, we've kind of talked a lot about it for our applications. If we go back to the CISA Roman Cathedral here, we've got identity, right? So zero, the, the cornerstone of our security is identity, right? So, and how do we do that? We broker different identities with Vault. Devices, how do we issue PKI certificates? We use Vault to issue PKI certificates to individual devices. Networks, how are we uh, segmenting network traffic based on the application ID, no matter if we're scaled to a million containers or 40 million containers like we talked about earlier with Nomad, or we're down to one node talking to another. Um, we can use console and PKI and, and scale out these network rules all the way out to you know, highly scalable environments. Um, in, in this case, data encryption. How do we create data encryption? Uh, we can use Vault to create encryption keys and then allow only specific um, access to only specific tables or databases or even records based on the encryption or the tokenization keys that I have using Vault and Vault I have to authenticate with. Um, again, visibility analytics. I'm only allowed to, I, I can hit that metrics endpoint on every single application and get telemetry data. I can also do audit logging on all those, those applications, console, vault, Terraform, Nomad. Automation and orchestration, we talked about Terraform. And governance, policy as code. So really in, in the CISA pillars, we kind of hit all of them. Um, there's, so this is kind of the zero trust story is how do we um, authenticate and authorize every single interaction? Um, let's go back to console real quick. Okay, so I want to talk about the API gateway. Let me just if I hit play here. Yes, okay, cool. Trusted connections, access control, simplify traffic management. Okay, so I talked about simplifying traffic management. If I had to scale down to two services, no big deal. But when I do scale out to, maybe I have a web server that has 50, like, uh, 50 different services in one, or 50, server, 50 different tasks in one service behind a load balancer, right? To do that, every single time I added a new task, I'd have to scale that out and then manage those IP addresses. In this case, I write one rule. If the service name is service A and it's connecting to service B, write a rule between them. And if that, that's the name, that rule propagates across the entirety of those, those applications connecting to each other. So in my example earlier, when we had like a Super Bowl commercial, and our front end web server had to scale out to a ton of servers, we could do that because we could scale out automatically and, and the rules don't change. The rule was service A was connecting to service B, just the different, the, the number of tasks in that service um, increased, which is no big deal. Access control and trusted connections, again, least privilege, credentials, encryption. <laughs> um, reduce risk by authorizing and encrypting all communications. I think I've said that enough times today. Reduce OpEx costs by gaining a greater insight into networks and managing at scale. So instead of having a million rules connecting to individual IP addresses around our environment, 
we have one rule for a service communicating to another service. Our rule list goes way down, right? I remember having to manage network firewall rules on a production environment, especially when we started kind of going into the private v uh, VMware environment where things were starting to get bigger and bigger and a lot more IPs. That became very cumbersome. Um, now we can reduce that, and we don't have to put in as many tickets. Flexibility to connect applications to any runtime. So am I running on Windows? Am I running on Linux or VM, container? I can run on any application, so I can run console anywhere. I can run in any cloud across those clouds, and I can join them together like they're a big federated environment. And I can run them on any application platform. So Lambdas, ECS, Kubernetes, OpenShift, you name it, we can run console at the service level and scale out and scale in and use console uh, to do our service mesh. And that's where I'll stop, and then we'll talk about boundary. We, we might not be able to get to boundary. So the deal with boundary, there's a whole lab that goes along with it. I've actually added it into this. So you guys should be able to connect to that lab and work on it on your own. In 15 minutes, I won't be able to get to that. I want to show you Vault and the console agent at this point. Okay, so console is at the heart of zero trust, machine-to-machine -machine communication. I've talked about the beauty behind it, the PKI infrastructure. In this case, we're not going to use Vault as the PKI uh, CA. We're going to use console as the CA, just because I didn't, there's a lot to go, go into switching that over. And I wanted to show that ability to kind of segregate the concerns of console being its own CA. Normally, what you'd have, especially in highly governed, uh, governed and... Um, environments with high governance, uh, we, you'd usually have a vault environment that was um, established. You'd have some sort of root signing or root CA uh, creation and generation uh, ceremony, and that would be recorded somehow, and you'd take those keys and you'd put them in a vault somewhere, and you'd have two-person integrity and all that kind of stuff. In this case, we're going to do it on the command line very quickly, but you get the point. Console is a critical component of the zero trust for machine to machine or NPE, non-person entity. <clears throat> so I'm going to set some variables first. Uh, I'm going to set, so console has the concept of a domain. Um, it has the concept of a data center. So it, say we had multiple data centers, but we were all in the same domain. We could set those separately, right? I could have data center one, US East one, East Gov two or whatever. And, but they could all be a part of the same domain. I could federate. In this case, we have a one console server. Normally, a console cluster is three to five nodes. So you could lose up to three nodes and still have a full uh, console cluster. And we could federate those between the different um, environments. <clears throat> so right now, we're saying, OK, my, my console config directory, so where I'm going to put my console config is console.d. And my cert directory is going to be console d dot, uh, the search path. OK, so I'm going to set those variables on the command line just so we have them. And I'm going to use them later. And the first step I'm going to do is create what's called a gossip key. Now, gossip is a, a protocol that allows for the, the consistency of data between uh, servers in a cluster. So I have a five, three to five node cluster and console. I need to be able to share that data between all those servers. So I can use the gossip protocol, which is the standard protocol for sharing that data between all the console nodes. And if you want to join the cluster, you have to have this key. Right, so the gossip key is set. Now, we're going to create that gossip key with the console key gen command. And then we're going to store that in Vault. But first, we're going to put it in a file here for um, the console configuration. So I should be able to cat this file. OK, so now we have this gossip key that was generated by this console key gen command. And then just so we have it for later when I want to update the app server, I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it on this path, secret console gossip. And I'll, I'll do away with it for now. So now we don't have to worry about it. It's in vault somewhere. So the next time this restarts, I'm going to use that same key that was stored in console. Now, I should be able to see that. Uh, okay, so we don't have anything in the search directory, so it's empty. And now I'm going to create, so this is the part where I'm creating a CA. So I'm creating the private key. I'm setting the domain. So normally when you create a CA, you do things like, here's the domain I'm on. Here's the CRL. Here's the, like, there's a bunch of um, attributes about that certificate that you want to issue across 
any leaf certificate that I issue. So right now I'm just saying, in this case, the domain is uh, DC, I think the domain is what? The domain is set to OpenGovCo, look at that. Okay, so we're gonna create the TLS cert. So this creates my private key and my public key. And then um, we're now gonna create the certificates for this specific console server, right? So when I have multiple servers, I'd actually create a one, two, three, four, five, however many consoles, nodes that I have in my cluster, I'd create separate keys for them. And I, then I'd wanna put them in a vault and then have that console cluster go access the, the credential that it's allowed to connect to and use those to connect to the console server. In this case, I have one console server. It's, uh, it's waiting on one server to join, so no big deal. Um, and then just so we have it for later, I'm gonna write those keys. So I'm gonna, you can see I have all these keys here. I'm gonna put three of them, the public key, the certificate file, and the key file, just a bundle basically, in Vault so I can access it later. So what you see here, I'm saying Vault KV put, remember that secrets engine we used, the, the static credentials? Secret console CA certain key file, right? Key is equal to, now in this case, these are keys. So they're formatted weirdly. So I can't just say string is this. In this case, I'm saying read in this file name. Um, that's what the at does. So I'm saying key equals at whatever's in this file. It just makes it so it's easier to read and write back and forth. So I'm gonna write those to vault. Boom, so you can see they were all in there. So if I wanted to actually vault read that, vault read. Now you can see, see it looks strange, right? So it's a map of this. But if I was to get this in JSON, it would actually format it nicely. And then we're gonna create the console configuration file. So first we're gonna to just touch the file. So this is the, the server.hcl is the file that console server is gonna to use to, when it comes up. It's gonna have things like, what's the console server name? Um, is it a server? If it's set server equals false, it's just a client. It's just a client in the giant uh, federated environment. My bind address, client address, that's just what it's gonna listen on. If you had a specific IP address, you could specify that. Domain, this is DC11, data center, um, oh no, vice versa, domain is opengov.co. And then data center is equal to DC1. The data directory, this is where when gossip is happening, all the data that's being sent back and forth between the different nodes is gonna be stored, encrypted in this slash data directory. And then the bootstrapped expect, now if I had a five node cluster, I'd say bootstrap expect equals five. In this case, it's a one node cluster. So it's bootstrap expect one. And then this is just to store the PID file. So if I restart, I know where it's coming from or what that PID file is. Okay, so console connect. So console connect is that intention thing I talked about. Remember I talked about firewall rules and being able to say that web A is only allowed to talk to web B. This console connect gives us, basically puts an envoy proxy in front of the service and does a reverse proxy between those services and only allows the connection between those two different services. That's console connect. Um, if, I, if I wanted to use gRPC, I could turn gRPC on. Uh, that's what I'm doing in this case. I can use TLS. And then I'm saying, hey, all that gossip traffic and all my API traffic, I wanna encrypt. I'm gonna use those PKI certificates that we talked about. And I'm gonna verify the host name, incoming and outgoing on every single interaction. So that's, this is the TLS configuration here. And these are the certificates saying verify them and then ver also verify the internal uh, RPC host name. So are you truly who you say you are? Yes. Does your certificate say that you are? Yes and then do auto encryption. So from a client perspective, it's gonna just look at that, that TLS certificate and um, auto, if it has the key, it'll automatically encrypt that traffic between two different services. And then we're gonna enable the UI. So that's the entirety of console, right? So you know, there's a million other configuration parameters, but for this, in, in this case, it's a very simple um, console configuration. So we're just gonna write that out to a file called server.yaml Except, uh, cd dot dot, that looked weird, didn't it? Cat server dot hcl. Okay, it looks like that worked. Okay, start the console server. So first thing we're gonna do, because I'm running console as the console user, I'm just gonna change the host, the uh, user ID and password, and then I'm gonna start console. System ctl status, console, 
Okay, so console's running now. So now I can run things like console members. So this is, give me all the nodes that are running on our console cluster. Well, in this case, we have one server. It's this console server. Um, another thing you can do is console catalog service, services. Uh, so we have one service in the entirety of the cluster, and then we have, we can say, give me all the data centers. So if I did have a federated environment and I had EC2, US East 1, I had my Azure environment on my on-prem, if I did give me a catalog of my data centers, I could list all the data centers here, I could list all the services in those data centers, and I could list all of the nodes that are in those data centers. So very nice to be able, from, a, from an admin perspective, to be able to see my, the entirety of my network from one place. And then we now have a UI. So if you are managing the console, you can actually see nodes, do, do the exact same thing I just did from the command line, but now from the UI. We have uh, nodes, close that. This is our node. Uh, if we had services, they'd be listed here. And then this is where we, we can create, we can do all of it here. We can create uh, intentions. We act, this <laughs> console actually can act as a, uh, a key value store as well. So if you're, if you have a reason to use a key value store, I, I ended up using it a lot for configuration. So if I'm using something like Ansible or some configuration per, uh, tool, a configuration management tool, I would use console to store all my keys and values for just configuration parameters. So I might have, an, I might have a reason that in US East 1, my Zookeeper node, I, I would put that in a key value store to say, if I'm in US East 1, my Zookeeper node is this. If I'm in US West 1, my Zookeeper node is this. Right? I might have different reasons to have different configuration parameters based on the data center that I'm in. Those I can store in console as a key value pair. And I can interact with that key value store just like I do with Vault. Right? I can say console, KV, get the path. So it's very nice from a configuration management perspective to be able to see those. Okay, so now we have Vault started. We have a Vault agent. We have console started. Um, and now we need to start a console client. So we want to register that data view service. So by using console client to register your local services, um, you can actually go and see where they are, right? Um, additionally, console provides a range of health checks. So when I start my data view service, so when I start console, I can put a little configuration block that, that says, when I register console, I'm going to register at this port, this health check. That, here's the connection string. So I'm going to pass in these variables again. OK, remember the, the key value that I added for the gossip encryption I, uh, on my CA file? I'm going to write that here on my app server. So I stored it in Vault before, and now I have access to it. Now, also with my encryption file, I got those from Vault, and now I have them. OK, so my client configuration looks very similar to my server configuration. The difference here is servers equal to false, right? So it's not server equals true. I'm a client. Um, all the same things, data center, data directory, domain, all that kind of stuff, log levels, retry, retry join. Now, I can go into this, but basically I'm saying if I, if I, for whatever reason, come off the network, try to rejoin to this server. Now, if I was using AWS, I could use the AWS tags to tell it where the console servers are, and I could automatically discover the console servers, and I don't have to manage those. Um, TLS certificate, so I, I'm giving it my private key so that I can join the cluster and communicate over, over, um, over TLS, and then I'm going to verify and auto-encrypt the traffic between us. So I'm going to write that config out, and then I'm just going to start console client on my app server. So this is the data view server. System CTL status console. Okay, so... Technically, all I've done now is started the client locally. So now I should only see in my nodes list that there's a new node. I haven't started, there's no services built into this yet. So now I have my app server and my console server. Two nodes are registered. I'm running the client. Um, the next step is going to be, okay, let's register these services. Now, okay, it's 5.30. I can quickly do the last step, because I think there's only one more step here, and then we can be done. Yep, this is the last one, and then we'll be done for, for the evening. Console Connect, now, okay, I talked about registering my services. I'm going to enable Console Connect on these services, and then start up the console sidecar, and then to manage TLS, um, 
but I'm going to show you the health check, the service identity, and then the console connect stanza here. So I'm going to, I'm going to set my environment variables one more time, do a console members, so I can see those servers that are now a console server, the ones that we showed in the UI earlier. Catalog services, we only have the one service, console. Okay, so now I want to, I want to add this data view service to the console registry. So I'm deploying my application. Alongside it, I have a little configuration file that says the name of my service is data view. The port it's listening on is 88. The destination, uh, I'm, I'm now connect, I'm creating a least privilege policy between WebA and the Postgres database and the port that it's connecting on. And then the health check that's associated with it. So if I try to get to a list of data view services, it would only give me access to the ones that are answering on port 888 uh, with name, data view, um, and then it checks that, does a health check every 10 seconds, and it times out over one second. So <clears throat> if you have a very short timeout and maybe you get overloaded, you'll start seeing flapping in all your services as they enter and leave the, the console service registry. All right, so I just created the file data view is gonna use. I'm gonna change the permissions to console, and I'm just gonna reload the service. So now if I do a console members, I should see the same two servers, but now I have the data view service and the sidecar proxy that goes along with that service. And that sidecar proxy is gonna create the least privilege access between that and the Postgres database. And um, it's going to manage the PKI certificate. Okay, so now we have this data view service that's in the registry, but it's down. Why is it down? It's because it can't, touch, it can't reach the Postgres database because we're not running it yet. We're not running it as a service in the service mesh. So we have our nodes, and we, don't, and we have the, the two services now. We have the data view service, and actually if I click on this data view service, you can see downstream services are unknown. So my service upstream is unknown as well because we haven't, the, the Postgres database is down. So let's create that service file real quick. We're putting that in the Etsy console.d directory. So we're saying, okay, we have, we have a new service. We're gonna use sidecar uh, console connect. The health check is found here, um, where the database is at port 5432, and we're naming it PostgresDB, just like we said it was gonna be called from the other service check. And we're gonna change permissions real quick. One thing we can do, just like Terraform validate, in Terraform format, we can do a console validate. It's saying right now, hey, I read your HCL file. It looks valid to me. Console can also be written in JSON. Um, we have the ability to write in either JSON or HCL. And I'm going to do one more reload. And now I'm going to run my console catalog services. And now I've got my Postgres database with the sidecar proxy. So as we were showing before, the sidecar proxies are basically a reverse proxy. So now we've created basically a direct line between the web server and the Postgres database. And now all I'm looking for is a local host connection when I'm running the web server database. Um, so now I do have to start the console. So actually, if I go into the console UI, so it looks like I have a Postgres database, but there's something missing, right? It looks like there's something down in this database. That's because the, the sidecar is not running. So I have to go start that sidecar. I'm gonna start the sidecar for both console data view and console Postgres. So now console catalog services, and I should see all my services, and they should all be green in my catalog. Data view now looks 100% healthy. If I click on the instances, Postgres database, I can see the connections there. So now these are all my health checks. If I were an admin and I was trying to figure out what was going on, I could see what was down and what was up just by looking here and then the health checks that come out of that. And then there, there are no upstreams from the Postgres database. The upstream from, it's the data view connecting to the Postgres database. So that is it. So now we, we are connecting least privilege, authenticated and authorized. Uh, we have managed PKI certificates between all of our applications. We have encrypted data between our MPE. Um, we have dynamic database credentials. And so we have zero trust from an application perspective. And the next step is to actually go in and use boundary, so we have an intro to boundary so that our humans can connect to services or machines in a least privilege access, um, but that's in the next one. So we finished both Terraform, Console, and Vault today, 
Thank you so much for being here. I'm sorry I went seven minutes over, but I'm kind of impressed with myself that I got that close. Uh, so very excited, and thank you so much for being here. Everybody online in here. Well, my friend, that was a marathon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>